Okay, can you give me a sign to get to get started? Ready, shall we? Hello and welcome to this episode of Conversations in Ideas. Uh, today's idea is securitization. Uh, by securitization, we're not talking about financial arrangements. Uh, we're not interested in talking about uh, the issuing of securities uh, such as assets and debt, which is common uh, in economics. But we are talking about this increasing significance of security narratives and discourses in the regulation of political life around the world, including interstate relations. Now, since 9-11, the war on terror has become the central organizing principle of state relations. Western countries, particularly the United States, began to define foreign policy through the lens of the war on terror. And key issues that traditionally fall outside the paradigm of security, such as human rights, democracy, humanitarian emergencies, such as refugees, questions around, around asylum seekers, development aid, all these issues began to be defined through the lens of national security. More recently, Western governments have been publicly stating that human rights and democracy are no longer their policy priorities, and frontline human rights defenders, pro-democracy movements have been advised to frame their claims against their own states, their demands for equality and justice in the language of security. What is this new phenomenon called securitization or the increasing significance of security? What are its central features and how does it manifest itself globally and locally? Here we are interested specifically about the Horn of Africa and the impact this discourse, this narrative has been having on uh, countries in the region. To discuss these issues in detail, I am joined by three guests. In Washington, D.C., we have Ambassador David Shin. Uh, Ambassador David Shin is uh, a diplomat and an academic. Uh, he has served in the U.S. Foreign Service for 37 years with assignments in several countries, including in Kenya, Tanzania, Mauritania, Cameroon, and Sudan. Uh, he also served as the U.S. Ambassador to Burkina Faso uh, during the Reagan administration and as an ambassador to Ethiopia during the Clinton administration. He is currently uh, teaching at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. In Germany, we have Sadale Lemma. Uh, Sadale Lemma is a journalist by training. She is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Irish Standard magazine. Uh, this is one of the most influential magazines uh, uh, in the history of the country, widely read by the diplomatic community in Addis Ababa. In 2014, Sadale was named the top 50 rising stars in Africa by the leading Pan-African magazine, The Africa Report. In Denmark, we have Tobias Hagman. Dr. Hagman is Associate Professor in the Department of Business and Social Sciences at Roskilde University. He is the author of several academic articles. Uh, he has co-edited four books. Uh, most importantly and pertinent to our discussion today is a book titled Reconfiguring Ethiopia, the Politics of Authoritarian Reform, and another book titled Contested Power in Ethiopia, Traditional Authorities and Multi-Party Elections. Thank you all for agreeing to join me uh, at this very odd hour. And I think this is uh, such a fantastic panel. I am delighted uh, to have this conversation with you today. Uh, Ambassador Shane, if I could start off with you, uh, how do you describe this this phenomena uh, in which security considerations uh, are basically allowed to take precedence over other values, such as the rule of law, freedom, and justice? And can you can you give us a historical perspective? Are there are there moments in history, for example, where uh, we had such phenomena where uh, security or security paradigms uh, became the dominant features of uh, political? In the case of the United States, uh, where 
really didn't have that much of a focus on, at least an international focus on, particularly on human rights until the Carter administration. Uh, there was a focus of sorts on democratization that goes back further than that, uh, back to the time of Woodrow Wilson. But it really was with President Carter that human rights came to the forefront in American foreign policy. And since then, it's been a bit of an up and a down kind of phenomenon. Uh, certain administrations have attached more importance to it than others. I think you're quite right in your introduction that with... Uh, the attacks on the United States in 2001, the terrorist attacks by Al-Qaeda, that did tend to transform U.S. foreign policy generally, and that did become the, uh, the singular most important component of American policy vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Uh, not that we lost uh, the desire to encourage uh, better human rights and democratization. It was still there, but it, uh, it took a back seat. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and even since uh, 2001, there has been something of a movement from one administration to the other in terms of the focus on it. And right now, you're seeing with the Trump administration, I think, a very distinct uh, backing away from support for both human rights and democratization. And I think you will see a, an even greater uh, impact of, of the Trump administration's focused on counterterrorism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tobias, your reaction to Ambassador David Chen's description? I think, I mean, um, first, first of all, thanks for having me on that program. It's an excellent opportunity to discuss this topic, which is hugely important, I think, not only in terms of state politics, but also because it affects the daily lives of people, directly and indirectly, right? And not being a security specialist myself, I think I would just like to point out two things. The first one is that security and secur securitization are not, of course, a new phenomena, right? Of course, they're most prominent now in their post 9-11 kind of manifestation. But security was a huge, has always been a huge issue because it is connected to the logic of the state, to, to sovereignty. Uh, if we think back about the Cold War period, it was all about it was all about security, right? In the name of security, massive armament occurred, massive conflicts occurred. So security and securitization are not new dynamics. I start to I start to believe that, um, I, you know, that if you look back historically, what we saw was maybe securitization is maybe more the norm than the exception. We had in the 90s and partly the 2000s internationally, but also to some degree in the Horn of Africa, this emphasis on democratization, uh, multi-party elections, think about Kenya, even think about Ethiopia in the 90s, 1990s. And this gradually, this focus on liberal democracy and human rights gradually was, you know, gradually eroded and security and securitization came back very strongly again. And on the one hand, this clearly has to do with 9-11 and its aftermath and counterterrorism. But I do also believe that it has to do with the kind of disillusionment about the ability of, you know, the ability to export and reinforce liberal democracy in some African countries. So it's not just 9-11, there are other factors at play as well that make security and securitization such a dominant and uh, discourse and practice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me let me just uh, put another question to you because this is something that falls within, within your expertise. Uh, as you know, in, in the last 20 or so years, um, um, well, in the last 10 years, the Horn of Africa uh, particularly Somalia, uh, has been the focus of counter-terrorism operations. Um, this is a global phenomenon that has local or regional manifestation. I just wanted to get your perspective on what the local manifestation of counter-terrorism operation is in the Horn of Africa. So, <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> so, so, basically, I mean, if in, in terms of classic conventional radical Islamic uh, kind of movements we've had, you could call them counter-terrorist operations for some time, right? We had Ethiopian interventions in southern Somalia, in Luke, um, earlier on, and then later on, uh, directly and indirectly, U.S. Uh, and other presence in, in Somalia and, and, and in the frontline states. So that's, that has been ongoing for some time now. We've also seen an increased mandate for operations for these U.S. troops. I'm sure that Ambassador Shin can elaborate much more on this. So basically giving U.S. troops more, a bigger elbow room to, uh, to operate against uh, Al-Shabaab in, in, in that case. Does that answer your question? 
Uh, poorly, yeah. I, I will definitely come back to some of some of these issues, uh, but it does it does serve the purpose. Um, Sadala, if I if I could come uh, to you, um, so Tobias uh, told us the more uh, military side of the counter terrorism operation. I, I wanted to ask you what the uh, impact of counter terrorism operation is in the region on uh, democratization and the pursuit of uh, human rights and questions of justice. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me join this uh, very interesting uh, panelists to discuss this very interesting topic. Um, having said that, um, I, I would like to you know, focus particularly on the case for Ethiopia, but um, at a, somehow at a, as a passing by note as well uh, in the region. Um, it, to me, um, I think the fight against terrorism and it's the most devastating impact uh, that it is having both in the region and particularly in Ethiopia as, uh, as one of the um, strongest military power in the region is um, its impact on the securitization of the judiciary branch in the country. What do I mean by that is uh, we, we are seeing... Uh, um, to a lesser extent since 2006, of course, uh, um, beginning from Ethiopia's um, incursion into Somalia, uh, but, but also since the of the anti-terrorism uh, property in Ethiopia, uh, beginning from 2009, uh, what we are seeing, what we are experiencing right now is uh, this gradual transformation of the judiciary branch of the government or the gradual militarization of the judiciary branch of the government in the haste of the fight against terrorism. Uh, are seeing increasingly the crackdown on dissident voices uh, being built as and being you know, portrayed as the fight against terrorism. Uh, both outside of the country. Um, recently, I don't know if you have followed that very interesting event uh, that Ethiopia repatriated about 120 Somali prisoners that were in Ethiopian prisons uh, for the last many, many years. And nobody, none of us knew about this. And, uh, um, you know, from my contacts with, with Somali journalists uh, knew about these people. What we hear is that these uh, these prisoners have been in Ethiopian prison since uh, most of them uh, since 2006, uh, and nobody knew about them. And they are victims of Ethiopia's war on terrorism in Somalia. Uh, while there has not been any judiciary or legal due process uh, that oversaw, uh, you know, the prosecution of these people, uh, we, we only knew about them, their repatriation to Somalia because of uh, the negotiation uh, with, with, the, with the current Somali government and the Ethiopian government now. So one of the most devastating impact uh, that the war against terror um, in Ethiopia and in, in, to, to a larger extent in the region um, is having is uh, the the crackdown on dissident voices, be it the human rights organizations or opposition parties and uh, activists and and all this uh, all in the name of the fight against terrorism. If mm -hmm. I ask, this. yeah, uh, I, I will I'll certainly come back to this, this point to flesh out some of some of the details uh, later in the program. Uh, Ambassador Shin, I want to come back to you. Uh, as you know, Somalia has made headlines uh, for several reasons in the last 20 years. Uh, first, it was a civil war between these various clans. Uh, then uh, it became more or less a failed state. Uh, some people refer to it as a fragile state. Uh, more recently, uh, it is uh, seen as a potential safe haven for terrorists. Um, and, and as a result of all those, uh, Somalia has become the focus of uh, international stabilization efforts for, for several years. Currently, we have certain changes. Uh, we have a change of government in Somalia and we have a new U.S. administration. I was just wondering if you think this new government in Somalia that seems to have an independent foreign policy and the new administration uh, uh, in the U.S. means something, uh, whether it, it could have 
um, a changing impact on the security dynamics in the region? I think when you look at, um, at the Trump administration and its probable policies in Africa, one has got to be a little bit careful about what it's going to do because, frankly, we don't know. Uh, so little has been said about Africa since uh, President Trump took office in January, and virtually only one of the key positions in the U.S. government dealing with Africa has just recently been filled, only within the last week or so, that we don't even have senior spokesmen, spokespersons um, in the administration in order to deal with Africa. So we're really um, sort of grasping at straws when we talk about uh, the administration's policy towards Africa. If I had to guess at what it will look like, uh, I, I would... I would make the supposition that, one, there is going to be a um, lessened interest in Africa generally. There's already been discussion by the administration to slash uh, foreign aid, most of which goes to Africa, by up to uh, 30%. Now, that will not prevail. Congress will uh, reinstate much of that aid. But the point is there's going to be a reduction in foreign aid. Uh, there's also been an emphasis on... Uh, counterterrorism, not necessarily in Africa so much, but in other parts of the world. But I think you can extrapolate that argument uh, or that policy to Africa. Uh, the president has given greater latitude to AFRICOM to make decisions in Somalia when it uh, when the U.S. uses force there. Uh, that's the one one indicator we have of what future policy will be, and. Uh, I, I, as a result, and I think there's going to be a decreased emphasis on um, on human rights in, um, in the world generally and, and certainly in Africa. So when you put all that together, it, it would uh, suggest a, a greater focus on counterterrorism uh, dealing with Somalia and the, the Horn of Africa generally, and perhaps a diminished interest in supporting development. Um, I, I hope I'm wrong, particularly in terms of the latter point, but I'm, I'm afraid that's where we seem to be headed. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me just raise one point here. Um, a number of observers, both in the West and in the region, uh, see the previous U.S. administration as very much uh, blind to human rights issues uh, in Ethiopia and, and also uh, in the region. Uh, but more specifically in Ethiopia, uh, President Obama traveled uh, to the U.S. and essentially endorsed uh, the Ethiopian state when uh, the government um, declared a 100% victory in the 2015 uh, uh, election. Um, so there was this perception um, um, among some circles that Ethiopia is a beacon of stability and, and security uh, in the region, it, it must be supported uh, uh, no matter what. Um, I, I was wondering whether the Trump administration would pursue that same policy on Ethiopia in terms of uh, supporting Ethiopian security forces uh, uh, and Ethiopia's counter-terrorism uh, uh, operation, uh, regardless of these questions around uh, uh, it's a democratic credential, um, human rights concerns, and so on and so forth. Uh, if this question is to me, uh, I, I have to go back to the point that we're all guessing when we look at what um, is going to happen vis-a-vis -vis Ethiopia and the Trump administration. To the best of my knowledge, uh, he has not uttered a single word about Ethiopia, nor has anyone in his administration uh, at, a, at a political level said anything about Ethiopia. Uh, as far as whether the administration will pursue a um, uh, sort of Ethiopian government, uh, pro-Ethiopian government policy, right or wrong, um, I think there will be a tendency to, uh, to put aside, to some extent, human rights concerns, but I'm not sure I would go so far as to say that, that uh, Ethiopia will have a... Uh, uh, a blank slate uh, in terms of the United States uh, as, it, as it moves forward with its policies. I think there will be occasions when, when criticism will be made. Thank you. Um, Tobias, um, now, as you know, it, Ethiopia um, was widely seen as um, uh, a very strategic ally of the United States uh, in the region. Uh, as a result of that, um, it 
to receive substantial uh, economic uh, technical aid from uh, the U.S. government. Uh, the country has built this powerful reputation as almost a regional police force uh, on behalf of the U.S. and the West more broadly. I was just wondering, given the change in Somalia and in the U.S., uh, whether the, the, the Ethiopian government can continue to maintain this image. Uh, that's a good question. I think, as Ambassador Shin is pointing out, uh, the, the, the Trump administration is the administration in name only. It's not clear what's going to happen. <laughs> so we, we, don't, we don't know. I mean, when it comes to Ethiopia and Somalia, in particular, Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian military presence uh, as part of AMISOM, but also before AMISOM, I think it's important to point out that, I mean, Ethiopian troops were present before AMISOM, right? Let us remember Ethiopian troops have been present uh, on and off before the arrival of the Islamic Courts Union in 2005 in Mogadishu. They intervened afterwards and then they became part of AMISOM. So what does that tell us? It basically tells us that securitization and the, and the counterterrorism agenda, but also UN peacekeeping is an opportunity for some, right? It, it presents a, and when I say opportunity, I don't mean to say that it's not, not per se a good thing, but it presents a, an opportunity to basically do what you've been doing already, but then do it, do it under the hat of the UN. And that's what happened with Ethiopia and also Kenya. And that is, of course, not a new phenomenon. We see it all the time. So countries benefit by basically re-hatting their troops, making them, uh, making them UN troops. That does not mean that they, are, you know, that they are part of a UN mission. We know that AMISOM is basically a, a combination of different national troops. There's not much coordination between them. Ethiopia pursues its own security interests in uh, Somalia, and it will do so you know, independently of AMISOM. And even when, once AMISOM is, is, is done and is finished, they will continue doing so. Mm. Let, me, let me just um, put one more question to you uh, in relation to this. Uh, as you know, one of the central features of securitization is uh, the insistence on the existence of a potential threat and justifying extraordinary power, extraordinary measure uh, that is extra constitutional or in some cases clearly illegal uh, to respond uh, to theoretically to that, uh, to that threat. Uh, to what extent is Ethiopia's mobilization of the discourse on the war on terror um, is one that is driven by genuine security concerns? I think it is, it is both, you know, the, I mean, you, as, as you will know, critics of the Ethiopian government will basically say, or non, not only critics, but many will say, Ethiopia intervened in Somalia on behalf of the U.S. They're, they're doing the U.S. dirty job in the region. And I think that is, uh, that is not, you know, that, that's, things are much more complicated, right? So Ethiopia has, of course, a genuine security concern with the, in the region, in Somalia, but also other parts of the Horn of Africa, as we know. But then it also pursues its own interests. And when there's, an, as I said, when there's an opportunity to present what you're already doing in terms of contributing to security, whether it's global or regional, then you will do that. So in that sense, securitization is like a, is a very fluffy thing. It's like a pudding. And once it's present in the room, everyone wants to get a spoon of it, right? It's a kind of what we in social science call, call a kind of register. It's a repertoire. It's a discourse. And once it becomes dominant, you whatever you do, you just say it contributes to security. I think... And we see that all around the world, right? I think that the, the important point is what Tadali pointed out, and that is it has heavy impact not only on the judiciary, also on parliament. Uh, securitization typically is something that the executive does. It's typically something that the military does, that armies do, independently of you know, the, the, the checks and balances completely fall away, right? So no more judiciary, no more parliamentary oversight. It's, it's by fiat of, of the sovereign, it's sovereign intervention. And that is the problem because it often goes hand in hand with a criminalization of dissent. Right? The mm. point when you're in a situation where, where you can present things as a matter of life and death, where it's all about security, this becomes the only rationale and it gives you an excuse to get rid of, to repress everyone who's, you know, who you, whom you don't like. And that is the real problem. It's not that these security threats don't exist. They exist and they're real and they need to be tackled. The problem is when this discourse becomes omnipresent, when it becomes the only game in town. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Salala, I'll, I'll come to you, but I want to I wanna raise or um, I want to put this uh, point that uh, Toby has raised to Ambassador Shin. Um, I think there is um, a huge number of people who believe that Ethiopia's intervention in, 20, in 2006 in Somalia was largely on behalf of the United States. Uh, what's your view on that, Ambassador? Uh- I don't think that was why Ethiopia went into Somalia. In fact, there was, um, I I was following the issue very closely at the time, and I talked with officials who were involved in the decision making, and even though there were some mixed messages from Washington at that time, for example, it's quite true that the United States was sharing intelligence, uh, overhead intelligence, with the Ethiopian government. And that is why many concluded that uh, the United States was uh, very supportive of Ethiopia's intervention in Somalia. There were others in the State Department who actually opposed the idea of the uh, Ethiopian um, intervention into Somalia at that time. And at least that's what they told me, and I have no reason to to doubt their their comments at the time. So I, I think there was a discussion that was going on, and I think that if you sat back as a third party, you perhaps could draw the conclusion that the United States was supportive of what Ethiopia did, but I'm not aware of any evidence to suggest that the United States uh, literally requested uh, Ethiopia to go into Somalia on its behalf. Ethiopia operated in its own interests, as it almost always does. It is not the cat's paw uh, for the United States or anybody else for that matter. I think I, I, I do share um, that, that perspective. Um, um, can I just ask, if, if it wasn't entirely on behalf of the United States, what were Ethiopia's security interests at that point to intervene in Somalia? Is it the Islamic court that the government um, stated at the time, or is it something more than that? I think it related uh, heavily to the Islamic courts, and I was critical, frankly, in 2006-2007 when when Ethiopia did send significant numbers of forces into Somalia. I felt that was was a a misunderstanding of the Islamic courts, and I think uh, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, I even believe that more strongly. Now, you had a rising from the Islamic courts later on, al-Shabaab, which is a potential legitimate threat to Ethiopia. And I would make a, a different argument uh, uh, concerning Ethiopian intervention in Somalia after the, the 2007-2009 period. But back at that time, I think there was a, some misunderstanding as to what the courts were and, and what threat, if any, they posed for uh, Ethiopia. And I'm not sure they posed any legitimate threat. Uh, but al-Shabaab does. And so it's a very different situation today. Mm. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that um, interesting point. Uh, Sadala, if I could come to you now, uh, would you say that Ethiopia in intervening in Somalia in 2006 had um, completely different domestic uh, intra-Ethiopia agenda in Somalia or agenda related to Eritrea, uh, not so much uh, the Islamic court as such? Well, Ethiopia has always had uh, a huge interest in in how things um, develop in Somalia. Um, It's not in any country's interest that you have a country that um, um, is without a government for more than two decades. Um, So Ethiopia has always been interested in in following very closely. Um, The stakes were very high. Um, The fact that the, the government in Somalia collapsed at pretty much the same time as um, the government in Ethiopia came to power um, uh, was not, um, you know, particularly uh, a helpful situation um, for Ethiopia to sit back and relax. Uh, you know, we have had incidents in the eastern part of the country where uh, a few incidents, security incidents that, uh, you know, the going off of bombs um, um, left and right, that was uh, giving the chills for, for Ethiopia. But historically as well, uh, Ethiopia is not a kind of country that could sit back and relax and watch things unfold in Somalia. So Ethiopia has always inherently uh, interest, you know, an in- inherent interest um, in keeping things at check uh, in Somalia. 
And so that contributed to uh, the incursion, as, as many said, in 2006 uh, 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 of, uh, you know, the dynamics, the, the local dynamics that were changing. And, and of course, the emergence of Al-Shabaab affiliated uh, uh, militant groups and, and also the, the, the role that was played by Eritrea uh, in using um, some of these uh, militant forces as a proxy to what Ethiopia believes is to destabilize um, its security there. So there are a multitude of interests for Ethiopia to go into Somalia. The question is whether or not Ethiopia has achieved um, what it always wanted to uh, by going into Somalia. Uh, uh, the fact that Ethiopia is uh, today not a part of the AMISOM and that it functions in and of itself by by itself, it's, 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 milita its military is uh, pretty much independent and they they uh, operate very much independent from that of the AMISOM, um, tells you that Ethiopia is not even confident enough in depending in, you know, in, in what AMISOM is doing in there. So uh, this tells you that continuous, um, you know, perpetual interest that Ethiopia always keeps um, in, in how things develop within Somalia. But, it you know, did it achieve what it always wanted to? This is an open question, and uh, we, you know we, we see a, a lot of relapses and lapses um, in security situations, and uh, that are uh, you know as recent as last week. Uh, so it ha it's not necessarily mean that it got what it wanted, but it doesn't also imply that Ethiopia should sit back and and see things unfold in Somalia with you know with a with a relaxed political um, um, uh, uh, attitude. I would I would say. That's an interesting point. Um, Topias, there, are, there is a view that is not mainstream, but uh, a very strong view that suggests that Ethiopia actually has an interest in keeping Somalia unstable. Uh, this is precisely because, well, they say Ethiopia not only wants Somalia to be unstable uh, and have security issues, but in fact, Ethiopia actually produces insecurities in the region to present itself as the only force that can present that that can uh, provide the kind of stability and security that the West wants. So it is significant that this reputation would would remain. Um, would you agree with this? If there is there some truth to that? Yes, that is a very interesting question. So you will often hear uh, our Somali friends making the point that Ethiopia wants to avoid at all costs the re-emergence of a strong Somali state, right? Because of historic enmity and, 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 and all we know. And while that might, might it sounds reasonable at, at first sight, I, again, I think things are more complicated. From the Ethiopian perspective, you know, nothing would speak against having a unified existing uh, functioning Somali state as long as the government is friendly to you, right? So that is that is that would be the first precondition. Mm. Um, secondly, you know, Somali politics are extremely volatile, they're very dynamic and hard to control. And even though Ethiopia is a major player, it's not the only player and it cannot determine how things run in Somalia. No one can basically. I mean everyone or let's say everyone can and that's why it's so volatile and so unstable, right? So what you see is Ethiopia basically in a very smart, um, but also organic kind of way, diverse its strategy by basically having good relations with all the different sub-national entities. So Ethiopia is very close to Somaliland, also very close to Puntland, at one point very close to the former transitional federal government, the current, the current government. So it basically has its stakes in all, in all these entities. Now, does that mean that Ethiopia wants to avoid at all costs a, a reunified Somalia? I, I don't. Things not at all cost. I don't think so, but it has to. It would have to be the right government, and much depends also on other variables and other factors. Because the Horn of Africa is an integrated region, Ethiopia has a Somali inhabited southeastern lowlands uh, that often are uh, have been politically unstable, and to some degree, the, the Somali inhabited parts of Ethiopia are almost part of that Somali space. So, so Ethiopia cannot calculate. You know, by discounting what happens in its eastern part from what is happening in the in Somalia proper, right? Mm. So all these all these things are connected, and that is why it's very difficult to come up with a kind of coherent strategy. Mm. Mm. Interesting, um, Ambassador. Um, given 
the uh, the nature of the Ethiopian the Ethiopian government. You know you know the Ethiopian government very well, and given the ways in which the ruling party is constituted and the ways in which it was running the Ethiopian states uh, since 1991. Is there reason to believe that Ethiopia's policy towards Somalia is very much informed by its own relationship with internal Ethiopian political forces? For example, uh, I'm referring here to uh, forces that are not necessarily within operating within constitutional framework. Uh, the Ogaden National Liberation. Ethiopia's constitutional framework. Well, let, let me first say that I, I generally agree with Ambassador Hegman's view of, of Ethiopia's position towards uh, Somalia. I think that in the first instance, uh, Ethiopia's preference is for a united, friendly Somalia, with the emphasis on friendly. And if it's not going to be friendly, then I think you can make something of an argument that uh, maybe instability in Somalia is better than some of the alternatives. Uh, but keep in mind that instability in Somalia is uh, costly for Ethiopia. That's why they're sending troops in regularly, why they have such a huge, partially why they have such a huge presence in the Ogaden. So this is not a, um, uh, a, a, an inexpensive policy for Ethiopia to, uh, to pursue. So as I say, the first, in the first instance, they want a friendly, a unified Somalia. As far as the um, the Ogaden National Liberation Front is concerned and other earlier uh, movements uh, in the Ogaden area, uh, in Region 5, that have uh, opposed the government uh, for a variety of different reasons and with different goals in mind. Uh, I, I think that by and large, in recent years, those have, have pretty much been separated from what is going on inside Somalia, somewhat to my surprise, actually. But the ONLF, for example, has never shown any particular affinity to get engaged in, uh, with Al-Shabaab or with any of these other movements, earlier movements that have um, been active in Somalia. So Ethiopia has had to sort of deal with that in a, in a separate uh, portfolio. And it looks, at least in the last couple of years, they've been fairly successful at that. I've heard very little about the ON, ONLF activities in the last year or two. And I think that's in part because they have Ethiopia has such a large military presence in the Ogaden area. But they seem to have dealt with that fairly successfully. Uh, but I, I think they do see these as uh, certainly related issues, but deal with them in different ways. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Um, Sadala, I, I want to come back to you. And I want to return to the point that you raised earlier about uh, the devastating impact counter-terrorism operations had uh, on human rights, uh, uh, various movements uh, working to promote democracy, uh, civil society, journalists, bloggers, and so on and, and, and so forth. Um, as a journalist, to what extent is the ways in which counter-terrorism uh, discourses, counter-terrorism tools are used in Ethiopia? target specific group of people, specific ethnic groups, specific religious groups. Um, is, is there something of that sort? Is it too strategic that it even distinguishes uh, between a particular group of people uh, in terms of how this, this discourse is mobilized? Mm. This is a very interesting um, question that needs a very, um, you know, a, a careful response, uh, if you can indulge me to that. Um, in the beginning, um, um, you know, when you look back to the genesis of how the, uh, you know, counterterrorism, uh, or the fight against terrorism impacted, um, you know, Ethiopia or the, any movement within Ethiopia, um, is that we, we have seen the first the first uh, sort of the, the, the you know the first uh, crackdown um, in, in the name of uh, the fight against terrorism uh, waged um, on on the on the Muslim movement in the country what we call the, the movement by the Ethiopian uh, Muslims since 2011. Imagine this is two years after the anti-terrorism proclamation was enacted in Ethiopia. Uh, between 2009 and 2011, there has not been so much of a use uh, for this 
proclamation or there, ha there has not been any uh, major crackdown uh, against dissident voices there um, uh, or, or use of the anti-terrorism proclamation. So the first round, the first really major implementation of this um, ATP began uh, with the prosecution of uh, the members of the committee, uh, what we call the, the Muslim um, uh, Solution Committee, if, I, if, I, if I'm calling the name properly. Uh, so, but since then, you know, they became the first targets. And it's very easy to portray, uh, you know, with what's happening in Somalia, with, you know, uh, the name Islam itself being uh, increasingly, you know, associated with terrorism in itself around the world, not just in the area, in the, in the region there. It was very easy for Ethiopia to, you know, project this image that that crackdown um, against the committee members was a very legitimate one. Uh, where, in fact, uh, you know, uh, there was no reason for us as, you know, this standard has been following this case very closely from the very first crackdown to the last day um, of the, the courtroom um, prosecution in the courtroom of the, 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 the Muslim committee members. Uh, so it has been one of the major image that Ethiopia has portrayed to the rest of the world in its effort to crack down against um, terrorism. It's not just only in Somalia, but also, you know, look, I am also uh, facing that potential within the country, within, you know, uh, in my own territory. So that was a big, uh, a, a big show off for for the Ethiopian government. But then it followed uh, with the journalists, uh, uh, the likes of Skander Nega and, uh, uh, you know, Riot and all the journalists that have been um, detained and, uh, you know, charged with the anti-terrorism, uh, you know, with the ATP. Uh, but then it began shaping into, you know, a very uh, distinctive form of uh, targeting uh, specific ethnic groups. Um, I would like to make a reference here to... Uh, a, a fairly new website uh, that is now established to track down uh, uh, people who have been charged uh, past and present with the with the anti-terrorism proclamation in the country now. And I was looking at some of the data in this website now. And currently, you know, we're looking at around 900 people facing uh, terrorism charges in Ethiopia. And uh, that specific uh, targeting of uh, a specific ethnic uh, group, uh, particularly the Oromo, uh, was what was followed. You know, it was it began with the Muslims and then went into the journalists and the rights activists, uh, bloggers, and and went into uh, a, a, a particular group, the Oromo. Recently, since the protest uh, last year in Amhara region and in Oromia, and also to some extent in the South, and, uh, you know, you see the new cases of uh, people being charged with terrorism from these three areas. But still, the overwhelming majority of the people are associated um, with the OLF. So that gives you the impression that the, you know, judiciary branch of the country has been, you know, com completely uh, with, with, with this uh, unprecedented amount of uh, use of the anti-terrorism proclamation to crush, to crack down with a simple, you know, simple people who have participated in protests, you know, being charged as terrorists today um, shows you that gradual transformation of the judiciary branch of uh, the government. Um, into this kind of heavily militarized, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, branch. Uh, you know, the, the courtrooms are very uh, revealing if you if you have you know the chance to follow some of some of these cases. So that's what we see now. You know, they are particularly targeting. Uh, you know, initially the most you know voiceful uh, uh, people, uh, the, the with the with the Muslims and the protest against the government by the Muslims in the country, and that followed with uh, rights activists and journalists and bloggers, and now that followed with uh, a majority of uh, you know uh, dissident voices in Oromia, and and now we see. In Amhara, we see people being associated with Patriotic Gimbal 7, uh, which is also, you know, designated as a terrorist organization by the parliament. Uh, and now, and also from the Benishangul uh, People uh, Liberation Movement, or BPLM, uh, we see a few cases in that uh, with this uh, tracking uh, website. And so this, this tells you particularly to what extent the, you know, the fight against terrorism has been 
targeting particular groups uh, in the country uh, and also follows particular incidents of protest against the government uh, and crackdown and then people being charged with terrorism after that. So this, this is the trend that we are witnessing today uh, uh, in, in the country. A very, very complex picture indeed. Uh, Topias, let me come to you. Um, I just want to follow up on this very question. Um, um, there, there has been criticisms uh, leveled against the state of states, particularly against the judicial institution, in that the judiciary simply became an integral part of the executive arm of the state. It's not there to second guess the regime, uh, but simply to rubber stamp the decisions that are made elsewhere. Um, as Adala was saying earlier, uh, there were um, uh, almost thousands of people. Um, I think in, in, in this um, website that you mentioned, there were close to 900 people who are uh, um, charged with counter-terrorism, with, with the anti-terrorism legislation. And my understanding is that those lists are limited to people around Addis Ababa, uh, I'm not sure to what extent it includes people who are being tried in the region. Can, can you clarify that? Uh, the, 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 the trial for terrorism-related uh, offenses in the country is currently happening um, in, in the federal courts in Addis Ababa. So this is one of the uh, legal hiccups as well, because people are being brought from all over uh, the country, as far from Bangay, you know, uh, uh, Ben Shangul and, and, and Gambela regions, and also from Oromia and Amhara regional states. They are being brought to the capital Addis Ababa because only the federal courts are, um, well, the government maintains that they're constitutionally uh, sanctioned to look into terrorism cases. So these 900 people that we are looking at today are people who came from all over the country, particularly Oromia, Amhara region, and the Southern nations and nationalities. Uh, and bear in mind that this is only the current active uh, uh, cases that are happening as we speak now. There are closed cases that uh, that contain more than 600 people that have been already sentenced. And these are also people who came from all over the country and have been tried in the federal uh, uh, high court at, in Addis Ababa because if it's related to terrorism, it's only the federal courts that are sanctioned by the Constitution to look into terrorism-related offenses. So mm -hmm. that's why that, that, that also has uh, very problematic complications of uh, legal matters in and of itself. Mm. Thank you for, uh, for that clarification. Uh, let me come back to you, um, um, Dr. Uh, Hagman. Um, you have written extensively on the particular manifestations of authoritarianism in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, you have studied the ruling party very well. Um, Sadala earlier in her point in relation to whether counter-terrorism operations or the anti-terrorism law was mobilized selectively against a particular group of people, I think the image she depicted is that it is getting complex, although initially uh, there seems to be a pattern of uh, very targeted uh, use of counterterrorism uh, laws and counterterrorism uh, powers against a particular group of people. Um, uh, what, what's your view on this? Um, is is the picture complicated, or is it obvious that um, it is, for example, used against the Oromos uh, far more than other other group of people? Or can we, um, you know, is, is there a different way of understanding this problematic? Yes, so it's, bo it's both complicated and simple. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a number of points. The first one is Ethiopia has a long history of using law against political opponents, going back to the Haile Selassie regime, to the Derg, most obviously, and the current government. If, and even if you look at the Ethiopian uh, civil code, there are so many clauses about protecting the state from its enemy. So we can see law can be both a, have a liberating effect or protecting human rights, but it can also be used to stifle political dissent, basically to aid authoritarian government. And that is clearly a very long tradition in Ethiopia. That's the first point. The second point is that the current government also has a long history of basically imprisoning, um, sometimes torturing uh, political opponents or those who are suspected of being political opponents, including suspected members of insurgency groups, if we think about the OLF or the ONLF. And it also has, its troops also have a long history of extrajudicial killings. 
for, for example, if you look at uh, you know the last ten years in the Somali region of Ethiopia, Region Five, uh, so-called Ogaden region. Uh, in this region, Ethiopian security forces have been operating um, have been operating basically without uh, accountability, and have been doing so even before the anti-terrorism bill. So, in that sense, you know you don't need an anti-terrorism bill to basically do whatever you want. The Ethiopian government. Uh, when, it, when faced with political dissent or violent oppression, has already done these things. I think in that sense, you know, when, when the Ethiopian government declared a state of emergency, uh, this sounds a bit cynical, but I was wondering why are they doing it? You know, because they, they are already, they are, they have already, they have always imprisoned people without, you know, without due process, right? Particularly in the periphery, if you go to the Somali region, you will see so many people imprisoned in, in jail over then, no due process, uh, torture, killings uh, happen quite regularly, as a matter of fact. So what is the, why do you need a terrorism bill? Well, of course, it legitimizes things, but I think one major effect is also that it intimidates people. So both the anti-terrorism bill, but also the state of exception are instrumental in, in intimidating people. It's not, it's not only to, it, it gives you legal, it gives you a legal instrument to put people in prison, but you can also do that without that, right? But it also allows you to intimidate people massively because everyone is afraid just to even say things or think things because you might just be accused of who knows what, right? And that again has to do, you know, it's a strategy of protecting the state, so to speak, that operates with intimidation that is extremely, well, not extremely, but is quite effective. Um, and it is very problematic and we need to, you know, we need to criticize it. And of course, you know, from the outside, it's easy because I sit in Denmark, you know, it's, it's easy to do that. But from the inside, it is much more difficult. But that is also why it is important for us in the West to hold our own governments accountable. When our own governments praise the Ethiopian government's record uh, on democracy, then we need to criticize them. It's the same like when President, as when President Trump uh, receives Egyptian President Sisi and has a good time with him. Then you know he needs to be reminded that this is an, an autocrat that has imprisoned and killed so many people, right? So we should not, we cannot be taken, you know, we cannot be consumed by that kind of logic. It needs to be resisted, quite frankly, and we need to point out analytically again and again, and empirically as well, by case, by, by example, what is going on. Otherwise, there is a risk that this kind, this kind of logic you know, becomes, the, again, the only game in town, and then there's no more legitimate democratic opposition, because everything becomes criminalized, everyone's a terrorist. Mm. And as you know, that kind of you know that kind of legislation and these kind of practices, what they do to the political opposition is, of course, that they further radicalize the political opposition, right? So in these kind of situations, don't expect the opposition to be you know to be moderate, right? How can you be moderate? What it basically leads to a dynamic of escalation. You will see extreme discourses on both sides, and that is what's typically happening in Ethiopian politics, right? Ambassador uh, Shin, um, Tobias raised a very interesting point. Uh, he said that you don't need an anti-terrorism legislation to engage your repressive practices, to eliminate your political adversaries from uh, the political space. You can basically use any legislations on the book, particularly uh, in criminal laws, laws relating to the protection of uh, the states, the security of the state, and so on uh, and so forth. And he is, I think, absolutely right in the sense that um, for example, um, as soon as the Ethiopian government uh, came into power, this government uh, came into power, one of the things they did was to uh, set up a process by which uh, those who were involved in crime during the past regime would be prosecuted. Uh, now, the issue around that trial wasn't that uh, those people should not have been prosecuted, but uh, there was an argument that the Ethiopian government actually used the process to construct a legitimacy for uh, for itself. Also, during uh, Post 2005 election, um, the leaders of the uh, Coalition for Unity and Democracy were accused uh, of um, major uh, crimes and they were uh, convicted. Uh, so, the practice of using the judicial system to eliminate adversaries from the political sphere is nothing new. Uh, there, is, there is a certain continuity. I was just wondering, um, Ambassador. Um, there was a moment in history in the past where people struggling for freedom and, 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 and justice and democracy 
uh, from authoritarian regimes uh, were accused of being uh, a threat to the state. I have in mind here uh, the situation in South Africa uh, um, when people like Nelson Mandela were accused of um, various sorts of crime, particularly in relation to uh, um, uh, harboring the ideology of communism. In those days, communism was really used against political adversaries of the state in exactly the same way that terrorism is used today. I was just wondering, is it the case that in the West, um, in Europe and, 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 and the US, um, key uh, policymakers, diplomats, decision makers, uh, don't see that these discourses can be bent and used for uh, an entirely different political agenda? Um, it, it seems to be the case that in the 1960s and 70s, most people in the West bought the idea that uh, Nelson Mandela was a communist, that he's, uh, uh, that he's a terrorist and so on and so forth. Now we have uh, opposition political party leaders in Ethiopia, like Bekele Gerba, Marara Gudina, Andwala Maragi, um, journalists uh, like Skinder Naga, uh, who are accused of what seems to be a politically motivated crime and um, held behind bars. I think every every nation, certainly the United States, is acting in what it perceives to be its own interests. Um, part of the problem in the past, when you go back to the South African and Nelson Mandela period, uh, or you look at uh, what is happening in the Horn of Africa today, uh, part of it is not uh, always having a total understanding as to what the situation is on the ground. I think that is truer with South Africa than it is with the situation in the Horn of Africa today. But I don't think in the U.S. government at the time I was in it, uh, in the African Bureau during that period of time. I wasn't dealing with South Africa, but I, I know what was going on. Uh, there, there was not a really a very thorough understanding uh, behind the views of Nelson Mandela or what he stood for. Uh, and it was uh, very late in life that the United States came around to see him as, as one of its closest friends. Um, it did eventually, but it, it took a long time. Uh, so one is, is misunderstanding. Two, whenever a, a country um, is engaging in foreign policy, it's, it's weighing all of its interests. Uh, and human rights and democratization is only one of them. And for some countries, it's not even one. It's, it's a non-existent interest uh, in the case of any number of countries that I could mention but won't. Um, the United States has always professed uh, to have it as something of an interest. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, in the case of human rights, it became quite important after the Carter administration. But the United States has not been consistent on this point. Uh, there have been various uh, administrations that are autocratic or authoritarian, or worse sometimes, that it has had good relations with because, one, there were major providers of oil, or uh, two, they were uh, backers of uh, the United States uh, uh, philosophy during the Cold War, or for any number of reasons. So the United States government is always weighing these other concerns, and it, it never will look at uh, support for democratization and human rights in isolation. That just does not happen. Uh, and unfortunately, in the case of, of some cases where it should play a larger role, it doesn't. But that's a fact of life, and I don't think that's going to change. If I, if I can chip in here with, with uh, Awal, if you can allow me, yes. uh, uh, apart from, of course, uh, you know, the interests that uh, Ambassador David Shin just mentioned, uh, we're looking at the uh, recent trend in, uh, um, in, in, in the issue of migration. Exactly the Ethiopian government and how that dynamically changed uh, the tone of diplomatic engagement. You know, the fear that this country of 100 million um, or more people uh, is going to implode, you know, uh, the fear of, 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 you know, refugees that from Syria that, that unsettled the European um, uh, country countries within the European Union, uh, and, and you see the, the, the language of diplomatic engagement uh, tuning into or fine-tuning into the containment of this uh, uh, very uh, frightening aspect of uh, 
Ethiopia imploding, you know, and uh, this country of 100, 100 million uh, people, uh, you know, producing millions and millions of migrants. Uh, as it is, it is uh, creating a lot of headache. Um, and you see the engagement shifting into containing this scenario. And uh, if, if you see a uh, recent trend is, uh, from, from the European Union, its engagement with the Ethiopian government, you know, their efforts in building um, uh, 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 industrial parks in the country that are going to be, uh, in their calculation, employing hundreds and thousands of uh, refugees, not only uh, Ethiopians, but also refugees from South Sudan and Eritrea uh, and Somalia. Uh, so that changes as well. You know, it's it's not only diplomatic interests that, uh, that they are keeping an eye on, but also this kind of external pressures that uh, countries under authoritarian regime are able to produce and how, uh, 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 you know, Western countries can fine tune their diplomatic engagement with, with, uh, with, with these countries, be it Eritrea or Ethiopia or Somalia. So this is another dynamic that we're recently witnessing uh, in, in the engagement. Um, so you see that the further we go into these uh, dynamics, the lesser and lesser the, the issue of human rights relevant uh, or, or they just take a backseat uh, during this uh, this kind of engagements. They do happen, but um, uh, not to the extent of the desire, you know, producing the desired impact. Mm -hmm. Which that's that's makes me, I, I would just comment, I, I think that's a uh, an argument that probably resonates more in Europe than it does in the United States. I think the United States feels because of the, the, the ocean separating uh, it from the continent of Africa, it's, uh, it's a little less concerned with the kinds of problems that we've already seen in Syria and to some extent in, in Libya, although Libya hasn't resulted in the same kind of exodus that Syria has. Uh, and as a result, it, it's a little less concerned about that than many of the European countries are. And I'm not sure that in the United States there's much concern about Ethiopia imploding. Um, it may be just because they're not looking at the situation that carefully or just because Americans come up with a different conclusion. But I, I think that's not that's not a topic of conversation in the United States today. Mm. Um, before I go, I go to our last uh, our last point, I just uh, on the base of uh, the point that uh, Ambassador uh, Sheen made, uh, how does, for example, the events of the last uh, one, two years in Ethiopia, uh, the year-long protest by, by the Oromos and then by Amharas and also by people in the south, uh, the declaration of a state of emergency, uh, I think uh, uh, Topia has made an interesting point earlier in this conversation that uh, Ethiopia already has sufficient extrajudicial, uh, extra-constitutional power at its disposal. It's a country that is already in some kind of de facto state of emergency anyway, but it was forced to declare a state of emergency. Now, it is very difficult to understand the, the sort of policy considerations behind the declaration of state of emergency for a country that can basically use any power, right? Um, but it was forced to declare a state of emergency for the first time. Uh, since this government came uh, into force. Isn't that a sufficient sort of signal for the US and other European or Western powers um, to, to pause and, and wonder maybe uh, this is becoming uh, a turning point in Ethiopia? Um, Ambassador, it's to you. As, as far as it becoming a, a turning point, um, again, I think probably not. The, the state of emergency has recently been removed uh, on the one hand. Uh, I, I, I wondered, too, why it had to be imposed at the time that it was. Uh, but the fact that it has now been removed, I think, um, also takes a, a lot away from that argument. So I'm not sure that um, what is happening in Ethiopia in the past year or so, although it was of great concern in the United States and perhaps even more so in European capitals, uh, I think the, the, the sense is that it's, it's quieted down a bit now, that things are returning to, to normal such as they are. And although there are still ongoing concerns about what is happening in, happening in Ethiopia, particularly with, with arrests of people, um, it, it, it just hasn't reached the level of attention that uh, it, it hasn't surpassed the many other issue, international issues that are out there in, in terms of the U.S. agenda. It's very far down the, uh, the priority list.
Mm-hmm. Uh, Tobias, um, you know, you 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 have written extensively in, on the different ways in which uh, the ruling party have been able to secure itself uh, over the course of the last uh, twenty or so years, um, and and obviously the 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 Oromo protests. Uh, the other protests throughout the country uh, were not simply uh, the result of one particular event. They are uh, consequences of uh, ethnic resentments and, and uh, indignation that has been uh, uh, boiling up uh, over a long period of time. Uh, I, I think in, in, in 2015, when uh, the Oromo protest started in response to uh, the Addis Ababa master plan, uh, it simply exploded. Uh, but there were series of uh, local level, uh, small scale protests that has been taking place at different times. Um, do you think, given the current um, uh, state of things, uh, that the um, government will be able to provide the kind of stability and, and, and security that the West thinks it can? To that question. Um, I, do, I do, this said, I would like to share two observations on the 2015 2016 events. The first one is that, you know, in terms of if you are a government and a regime, one thing is to worry whenever there is open opposition, whether it's in the form of an insurgency in one of the peripheries or whether it's in its political form, think about Kinjit or CUD in 2005. Of course, you'll worry and you'll take the necessary kind of mechanisms, both political, criminal, military, whatever. That's one. But these are kind of organized groups. What was extremely worrying you know, is when you have this kind of, well, not fully spontaneous, but still kind of, you know, kind of decentralized kind of protests that you saw emerging in the last two years. That is really worrisome. Because you know, in the Ethiopian context, when people go on the streets, it's you know, it's a sign of desperation. Because you know that once you go on the streets, you know that you will you will face repression, right? So you don't do that. This is not this is not something you do for fun, right? It's really because you know, because you're really you're really really mad and you're really angry. You don't see no other solution. So that is really worrisome. And it also potentially, once it gets out of hands, it's very difficult to contain. Because you, you lack the typical kind of interlocutors that you can rely on, that you can interact, that you can engage with to bring things down, to calm, you know, to pacify things. That is the first observation. The second observation has to do with Western donor countries and Western diplomacy. I believe that because of its long involvement with the current government and support to the government, sometimes also critical, but overall very positive, particularly the, the US, the UK, and also the EU, um, these donors have bet, have made a bet with, the, with this government, and if, and I say, God forbid, you know, this kind of, you know, if a political escalation emerges again, if we see instability, if we see mass protests, if we see something akin to civil war, I am very much afraid that these donors have very little stake and very little legitimacy and very little means to intervene between different parties. Because there's so much associated with the regime. They also lack the kind of, I mean, they have good relations with the Ethiopian government, but they have, they lack a history of brokering things. So in that sense, I would, I would be very surprised if third party intervention and mediation, you know, would be successful. I mean, at one point, yes, the U.S. can always come and intervene, but the U.S. has other problems right now. So if things do get out of hand, I'd be, I'm mean, very, very worried that A, both domestically and B, internationally, um, that it will be very difficult and very terrible for Ethiopia. So that basically means, if my analysis is correct and it's very well possible that it's, that's not the case, we really need to you know, hope that there will be domestic change from within Ethiopia. At one point, it has to come in one form or another. Mm-hmm. Um, um, thank you very much for uh, for that perspective. And I think the the, the ethnic dynamics uh, and the kind of discontent that has been brewing under the surface in that country doesn't seem to be properly understood uh, uh, in the West, and that is what is uh, worrying. Uh, let me come to the last point. Um, human rights activists, pro democracy movements uh, are being encouraged. Uh, today in Ethiopia and across the world uh, to use 
uh, a security framework or a security paradigm to articulate demands for human rights. Right? So instead of saying um, we are human beings, uh, by virtue of being humans, we are entitled to certain uh, rights, such as life, liberty, uh, um, and other um, uh, cultural or uh, social rights. Um, what, what is the, the implication of turning to the language of security, saying to Western diplomats and actors that if you don't uh, support pro-democracy movements in Ethiopia or in other countries, uh, that there will be um, major security issues, security problems. So is that, do, do you think that is the right approach uh, for human rights activists and pro-democracy movements? Um, I, I can start with you, Prof. Um, Ambassador Shen. I'm not sure that I see that there's much to be gained uh, with that, at least in terms of the United States. I can't speak for any other country. I can't really even speak for the United States any longer uh, since I'm not part of the government. But uh, I just don't see that argument as resonating. And I, I see it resonating even less with the Trump administration than earlier administrations. But I don't see it resonating with any administration. Um, it almost sounds like a bit of a threat. and. Um, Governments don't take very well to what seem to be threats, um, and I, I, I'm, I just it, it strikes me as, as just not the right approach for for people who are pursuing uh, human rights to um, to suggest that well maybe we need to take matters I guess you're saying into our own hands uh, by using more violent means. You know, maybe I'm misreading what you're you're saying. My point actually was, it's not that uh, people will resort to using violent means, but they are, activists are being encouraged increasingly to use security frameworks. Uh, the implication of, for example, not supporting human rights for uh, the security of various countries. As Salari was saying, for example, the fact that um, authoritarian regimes like um, um, the Syrian uh, regime, the, the regime in, um, in, in Libya was allowed to continue for so long, resulted in the kind of uh, problems we have seen in those countries. Uh, that line of argument, instead of saying we are all entitled to certain rights, our governments should respect that, US governments and Europeans should not support authoritarian regimes simply because there were security concerns. Well, even even if you leave out the the violent response, I'm not sure I see that much distinction between that approach and the existing approach. Um, maybe there's more there than I'm seeing, but to me, it, it just sounds like a different kind of rhetoric, and I'm I'm not sure it's going to make any difference. In the final analysis, a um, a foreign government is going to respond uh, more forcefully to. A, a human rights situation or a lack of, of democracy if it finds it in its own interest to do so and not before. Adela, your view on this? Uh, can I come to you, uh, Tobias? I think Adela is frozen there. Uh, can you hear me, Adela? Yes, I can hear you. You were frozen as well for a while. I, okay, <laughs> I, I, I thought we lost you for a minute. Um, <laughs> your view on this last point about... Can you hear uh, me? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, can we get your view on this last point? Um, if, you, if you can paraphrase it for me, please. Uh, I, so I lost the last the question few. Was, the question was human rights activists, pro-democracy movements are being encouraged to use security frameworks in terms of articulating their grievances uh, against their government, in terms of their engagement with foreign actors. Uh, the question is, is this the right way to go about it? Well, this is, this is uh, definitely... Definitely not the right way to go about it. But uh, it's so worse in Ethiopia today that even this does not exist. Uh, 
we don't have human rights um, um, organizations that are functioning, um, even as they are willing to frame uh, the discourse uh, based on, you know, um, security uh, dynamics. Uh, there is a tremendous pressure. Um, there is only one independent um, human rights organization um, in Ethiopia today, the, the Ethiopian Human Rights uh, Council, if I am not uh, uh, miscalling the names. Uh, we don't have any other. So it, it sounds very luxurious now to talk about the existing um, uh, rights activists or independent think tanks uh, that... that, that are working outside pressure from, from the government. So, A, you know, it, even if they are there, it's not the right way to do. Uh, it's a, it, it signifies a, a huge misunderstanding of the, the reasons why independent rights activists or independent um, rights organizations, think tanks, should exist. Uh, but even uh, even that to that extent it doesn't exist which makes it which makes it very very difficult because what we have seen last year or during the protests is that there has not been any intermediate you know it was the government uh, fully armed government forces and citizens who just spilled into the streets uh, there was no platform for these two to meet and and uh, we had, you know, we had this. This this was a very revealing moment for us. That in a way that there was no other way the government and the citizens were uh, were w would have a chance to talk together. And this shows you the lack uh, of intermediary forces. And this is the impact uh, of having wiped out all the independent actors or non-state actors, be they are uh, rights activists or gender or, you know, you, you name it. There are, you know, multiple actors that should be between a state and citizens. Uh, it doesn't, it simply does not exist in Ethiopia. Uh, but in the event that it exists, this is wrong, you know, that they frame their agendas based on um, uh, security discourses. It's, uh, it's just simply the wrong way to go about it. It doesn't serve uh, the intended purpose at the end. And this is my reading. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I suppose you, you're absolutely right in that the, the civil society uh, um, uh, community that existed uh, in the country has been decimated as a result of the uh, societies and the charities uh, legislation. Uh, but still there are people on the ground, on an individual basis, asking questions. Uh, all those people who came out to the street to protest, uh, forcing the government to uh, to do uh, something extraordinary, that is declaring a state of emergency. Uh, those are people who are articulating demands. And even those people are being told to fashion, to frame their demands in terms of this uh, security narrative. Apparently, nobody else is interested today in human rights or in democracy. You have to talk about instability, peace, and security. Uh, what's your take on this point, uh, Tobias? Yes, it's an interesting question. I think I understood. Actually, I think I actually understood your question. So one thing, you know, we, you, we, you could say, you know, no one wants to hear about democracy and human rights, and, and in any case, everyone is, is shouting about his or her grievances, his or her rights not being respected. And that is not just in Ethiopia; that is a worldwide phenomenon, right? So would it make more sense to talk about security, basically to say, look, do something against this government because if things continue the way they do, things escalate, we'll have you know, major conflict, instability, so we'll have so much insecurity, it's it's good for no one. Could that be a more, you know, could that be a better selling strategy, a better communication strategy? Maybe, I don't know. But I will say one thing. I think it is important for civil society and for all, everyone, to reclaim security, because security cannot be something, A, cannot just be about physical security in the sense of military security, but security has always to be you know, a, a comprehensive thing, right? We, we are human beings. We need social security, right? Uh, we, need, we, need a, we need health security. Even the U.S. now has, has, a, has, a, you know, has a, something like a, like a state-organized health plan, right? We need cultural security. It, it's a multiple thing. The moment you have a dynamic of securitization where government says, you know, it's all about security and that's why I need to comply with these things, all these other kinds of securities 
get pushed away. It's all about the logic of the state. And in that situation, it is important to reclaim security. People need to reclaim security because everyone has the right to be secure from not only from terrorists, but also from indiscriminate or unfair or brutal intervention by one's government, right? That is a basic security that we need to secure. So I think, yes, why not? You know, uh, it, security can be and can be a good frame, it, it, but it shouldn't be the, the government-possessed kind of security, the military security rhetoric, but there are other types of security that are absolutely essential that we all need, and they need to be claimed, and they need to be reclaimed again and again. Thank you so much. That's a very good point to end on. Um, Adele Lemma in Germany, uh, Tobias Hagman in Denmark, Ambassador David Shin in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, until uh, we come back next week with another episode, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thanks for joining me. Uh, Mr. Editor, can you give me some signal? Are we offline? Editor. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this off and I'll call you back, guys. Uh, I would like to hear uh, your thoughts. So let me turn this off and I'll call you back. Sure.